So good afternoon and welcome to the latest Brodie's Banking and Finance Academy with this session focusing on funds finance and the modernisation of Scots law. My name's Megan Vasey, I'm a trainee solicitor in the banking finance team here at Brodie's. I am joined today by Ailey McMillan and Jamie Steele, who are both associates in the Brodie's Banking and Finance team. Ailey is going to kickstart today's session with a short introduction to Scottish Limited Partnerships and their use in fund structures. After this, we'll move on to a Q&A session where we'll look more closely at the security package taken in fund finance transactions. So whether the financing be subscription line or NAV financing. And we will also take a look at how the Movable Transactions Scotland Act will have a significantly positive change on current practices when this does come into force. We'll then end the session with a brief consideration of the new limited partnership registered office address requirement introduced by the Economic Crime and Corporate Transparency Act 2023. So Ailey, I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, Megan. So we've prepared a very simple structure chart as an example of how an SLP would set within these types of transactions. Um, the SLP will have limited partners. Uh, they may also be SLPs and it will be managed by a general partner as well as quite often a manager. The various rights and responsibilities of those entities will depend on the terms of the limited partnership agreement and any management agreements that are in place. Um, and there are a few reasons that SLPs are used in fund finance transactions. One of the main unique features of an SLP is that they have separate legal personality, which is in contrast to partnerships in other jurisdictions. So this means that SLPs can be sued in their own name and although they act through a managing entity, they can own property in their own name. They're also tax transparent entities, which is another feature which makes them an attractive investment vehicle. In terms of security, there are two main types at SLP level. Uh, we've got capital call security, which is common in subscription line facilities and limited partnership rights security, which we see more often in NAV facilities. It's worth noting at this point that the Movable Transactions Scotland Act 2023, which is expected to come into force towards the end of this year, is going to make significant changes to aspects of taking security in Scotland. And in a fund finance context, it's going to really simplify the process and remove a lot of the difficulties that we see at the moment. So over the course of today's session, we're going to explain some of those difficulties and then we'll explore how the law will be modernised by the MTA. We'll look at how the MTA will update and simplify the perfection process of security in Scotland, including methods of intimating to counterparties where this is required, and provide clarity around certain areas of ambiguity relevant to Scottish security. Thanks for that really helpful introduction, Ailey. Um, so let's now kickstart our Q&A session. So to start with, Jamie, I am interested to hear your thoughts on how we can go about securing the SLP's right to receive limited partner commitments. What is the best way of going about this? Thanks, Megan. So, um, so this is the type of security we see being taken in relation to capital call facilities, where the value is in the investments being made in the structure by the limited partners of the SLP. So generally, if you want to secure an SLP's right to receive commitments by a limited partner, the SLP would assign in security by way of an assignation in security, its right to receive the limited partner's uncalled commitments due under the SLP's limited partnership agreement. So as Ailey has mentioned, um, as an SLP has separate legal personality, this type of security is granted by the SLP itself, as well as any managing entity holding the right to make capital calls or issue drawdown notices um, and receive the proceeds. So this is usually the general partner or the manager or sometimes both and the terms of the limited partnership agreement itself um, and the management agreement should be checked carefully. The security must then be intimated to the limited partners to be effective. However, it's probably worth saying that one issue we currently have with this approach in Scotland is that usually the security will be drafted so that the rights remain with the grantors of the security until a specific trigger event occurs. So this renders the assignation potentially incomplete as a security holder does not explicitly control the asset. Security is then taken over the proceeds of capital calls 
and, and that can be paid into a blocked account for the benefit of the security holder. However, the effectiveness of bank account security, if those accounts are in Scotland, will depend on the nature of the accounts and how the security is to operate in practice. So this differs from the security package taken in NAV facilities, where, secure, where typically security is taken over the fund's assets and or the rights to the cash flow and distributions that flow upwards from the fund's underlying investments. Thankfully, as Ailey has mentioned, the new Movables Transaction Act coming into force will, will assist with several of the issues that we see and, and we'll come on to discuss this later in the presentation. Thanks, Jamie. That's really helpful in a subscription line context. So, Ailey, what do you see the security package looking like in a NAV context? Yes, yeah, so the security generally taken in a NAV financing where the value lies in the SLP itself and its underlying investments would be an assignation over the rights of the limited partners. So that's ownership rights and any rights to receivables. Um, the issue we face in Scotland is that to perfect security over limited partner rights in an SLP, the security holder would have to become the registered limited partner in that SLP. And by doing that, they would be assuming all of the obligations and risks that come with that. It's very similar to taking share security in Scotland, if anyone has come across that issue. Um, it's not a particularly attractive option for lenders or investors. Um, so the approach that we take is to have unperfected security over limited partnership rights. So the assignation would be entered into in day one so that the contractual arrangement is in place and the security holder would have the ability usually on an event of default or another trigger event to perfect the security and become the registered limited partner. Um, and there'll be a bit of due diligence that would need to be carried out at that point, um, just on the risks associated with that particular fund, should that scenario arise. Um, but so that we do have day one security in place, we take a second assignation over the rights of the limited partner to any receivables associated with the SLP. And that is perfected at completion by intimation to the relevant counterparties. Um, so those are the main types of security taken at SLP level um, that Jamie and I have just covered, as well as some of the difficulties in taking that type of security. But we mentioned before the MTA, which is coming into force this year. Um, the MTA is a complete modernization of the security regime in Scotland, and it's going to bring a lot of changes, which will make taking, taking and perfecting security much simpler. Um, so in a fund finance context, the Act should, subject to some further developments, make it permissible to take a pledge over both capital call and limited partner rights, as opposed to taking an assignation, and this will cancel out a lot of the issues that we see currently. Um, I say this is subject to further developments, but discussions are underway. Um, essentially, there will be a new register of stat statutory pledges created, and it will mean that we can take a statutory pledge over these types of movable assets without actually having physical possession of them, um, which, as Jamie mentioned, at the moment can be a bit of a roadblock when putting together a security package in Scotland. Um, and this is a new fixed security right, which will be available to multiple types of entities, including SLPs. Thanks, Ailey. So what about a floating charge? Would it be possible to take a floating charge from an SLP which covers all of the assets of the SLP? Unfortunately, no. SLPs themselves can't grant floating charges. Um, they can only grant fixed charges over specific assets. Limited companies and LLPs in Scotland can grant a floating charge, though. So if you have either of those entities within the structure, maybe as a GP or an LP, it can sometimes work to take a floating charge at that level. Thanks, Ailey. So, Jamie, considering that the SLP cannot grant a floating charge, I'm now wondering about the possibility of security being taken over specific assets belonging to the SLP. Specifically, would it be possible for me to take security over the SLP's own bank accounts? So it's not possible to take a floating charge over bank accounts located in Scotland, but if the Scottish Limited Partnerships bank accounts are located in Scotland, an assignation of insecurity of accounts is possible. But again, as I mentioned before, the, the nature of those accounts, whether it's a general current or deposit account, um, 
and how the security is to operate in practice um, will all have to be taken into consideration. So under Scott's law, in order to create valid fixed security over the SLP's bank accounts um, in Scotland, as is the case in England, the security holder does require to be in control of the SLP's bank account. There's no concept of equity under Scott's law, therefore, if the charger or should the charger have control over the bank account subject to the charge, the security will potentially be incomplete and there is no possibility in Scotland of it being redesignated as a floating charge. If, however, um, the bank account is blocked, um, fixed security can be created by taking a Scots law governed account pledge with notice to that effect um, being given to the account bank. So Ailey mentioned earlier, earlier that SLPs have separate legal personality. So how does this intertwine with security over bank accounts? Would a floating charge granted by the general partner be able to cover the SLP's bank accounts? So if the general partner is a limited liability partnership or a limited company rather than an SLP, it can competently grant a floating charge. However, the floating charge would only extend to the general partner's bank account and not the SLP's bank accounts. So that's probably quite an important distinction. It's probably also worth flagging that any bank account held for the fund should be in the name of the SLP rather than the general partner itself. So if we now steer away from security being granted by the SLP itself and we look towards security being granted at the general partner level, I'm wondering what security can be taken over the general partner's interest in the SLP? Yeah, so I touched on this briefly before, but if the GP is a Scottish limited company or an LLP, it is permissible for that entity to grant a floating charge. Um, this can work but commercially often the GP or manager is only given limited recourse security in respect of specific assets so often commercially it's not feasible. Um, in terms of fixed security Jamie's already explained the GP's role in granting capital call security and that's the main form of security that we see in relation to GPs. Um, there is an option to take security over the general partner's interest as a GP um, sorry, as the GP in an SLP. Uh, but again, at the moment, to perfect this type of security, the security holder would need to become the registered GP. Um, and we don't recommend this approach at the moment as the GP's interest carries unlimited liability. Um, and that's in contrast to a limited partner where liability is usually limited to their contributions provided that certain conditions are met. Thanks, Ailey. And to explore the security package a bit further in the context of the general partner, can you please tell me what security can be taken in relation to the GP entity itself? Yeah, so that would depend on the entity. If we have a company, for example, security can be taken by way of a share pledge or the overseas equivalent where the GP is an overseas entity. Um, where the GP is a Scottish LLP, the appropriate form of security is an assignation and assumption, which similar to an assignation over limited partnership rights is usually intimated at the outset, but not fully perfected. Um, this is so that the secured party doesn't assume the liabilities of a member of the LLP at the outset, but has the ability to become a member and assume those liabilities if it chooses to do so on enforcement or beforehand if the trigger event is an event of default. Um, and the main liability of a member of the LLP would be its capital contribution. And there are some further liabilities akin to that of a director of a company. Jamie, we discussed earlier the ways in which security can be taken over various rights, such as over the general partner's right to make capital calls and so on. If an assignation of rights does take place then, I'm wondering what steps do we need to take to notify the relevant counterparties? And if so, can notice be given electronically? Yeah, so again, so currently under Scott's law, notice or intimation of an assignation of security over rights must be given to the relevant counterparty for security to be validly created 
and to perfect the security. So in fund finance situations where security is being taken over the rights to call for or rights to receive commitments, that means intimation notices must be sent to all the limited partners. So the current safest means of giving notice under Scots law and the approach we take is by posting a certified copy of the assignation to the limited partners and that's to comply with the current legislative requirements um, dating back to 1862. However, depending on the number of limited partners, this can obviously be a time consuming and costly process. So whilst there is possible possibility to give notice by email and through online portals to large numbers of limited partners. This can also give rise to administrative headaches in terms of ensuring that those limited partners have received and that they are aware of the effect of the notice. And therefore, if you were to go down and use this approach, backup nervous uh, notices would have to be served uh, by post um, and so I guess all in all, the process of sending intimations um, is really outdated and it, and it can be efficient in terms of time and costs. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, so we have spoken a bit about the MTU. Let's delve into that a bit further. Will this legislation have any positive changes? That's right. So there are positive legislative changes on the horizon for assignations and assignations in security. The modernization of the law introduced by the Movables Transaction Act offers some streamlined options, especially in, re in relation to notice mechanics. So firstly, under the new regime, there'll be a new online public register of assignations in which an assignation in security over rights can be registered. So this new register of assignations will allow lenders to bypass the notice or intimation process um, and the assignation and security will create valid, valid security over the assigned rights on registration. Secondly, where traditional intimation is preferred over registration, the Act provides that notices can be deemed effective when served by email or by an electronic link to a website or portal. So this will waive the requirement of notices being issued to limited partners and other counterparties. And that will allow for the proprietary effect of assignations to come into effect on registrations. So these new provisions going forward will facilitate the notice process for fund finance clients. And as a result of these changes, assigning rights in fund finance situations under Scots law will be streamlined and modernized to make use of online filing, it, filing and electronic notices. So I think we're, therefore we should really all expect a more efficient international friendly process of granting security over rights related to Scottish limited partnerships. That all does sound very positive and a very welcome modernisation of Scots law to all, I'm sure. It um, sounds like it will really help simplify the existing notice procedure. Whilst we're still on the topic of discussion in assignations and security, I wonder then what happens if the limited partners or their commitments change further down the line? Does a day one assignation by the general partner or manager of the right to issue call notices cover those changes? Yeah, so this query does come up a fair amount. Um, at the outset of a transaction where we're taking capital call security from the SLP and its general partner and or manager, that would secure the right to call for capital from the limited partners at that point in time. Um, there's some uncertainty in Scotland about whether assignations and security would cover future rights not in existence at the point of granting the security. And because of that uncertainty, we would advise that supplemental assignations where, for example, new investors come into the fund. Um, it would usually be an identical form of assignation just taken at the appropriate later stage. Uh, but thankfully, this is another area where the MTA coming into force will be really useful um, because the Act explicitly allows for future rights to be secured. And it means that these types of assignations can be drafted at the outset to cover future and current drawdowns, really, drawdown rights relating to limited partners of the fund. Um, so those assignations can be granted at completion and it will cover any limited partners who join subsequently. Um, and a similar point is that conditional assignations are a bit of a grey area in Scotland, um, in the Scottish security context particularly. 
So, for example, it's very common in other jurisdictions for documents to be entered into but only become effective after a later trigger event. Um, and we try to avoid this in Scottish documents because of the uncertainty. But again, this will be covered off by the new Act, which provides explicit authority that conditional transfers can be effective under Scots law. Um, so as we can see, overall, the coming into force of the MTA is very positive and very long awaited. Um, it's going to provide a completely new regime for taking security over mo movable assets in Scotland, allowing for a statutory pledge to be taken and remove any need to have control over the assets, which, as we can see at the moment, creates a lot of uncertainty. Um, we've also seen that the intimation process for assignations will be very much brought into this century by allowing electronic means of intimation. Um, and in fact, intimation can be bypassed completely where the assignation is instead registered in the new register. Um, the MTA also clarifies certain points of uncertainty which currently exists under Scots law, like conditional assignations and securing future assets, and just brings Scotland in line with a lot of the other jurisdictions that we see on these types of deals. So moving on to something slightly different, Megan, you've spent time working in our funds team, and I understand that there are other legislative changes coming into force that will have an impact on SLPs, and in particular, the ability to migrate an SLP's registered office after incorporation. Um, did you want to talk more on that? Yeah, so as I'm sure many of you will know, the Economic Crime and Corporate Transparency Act uh, was enacted in October last year. So part two of that act has introduced a wide suite of limited partnership reforms. Um, one of those reforms being a new requirement for UK limited partnerships to maintain a UK registered office address. So an attempt to prevent UK limited partnerships from moving their principal place of business address overseas without notifying Companies House and really just to ensure that UK limited partnerships maintain a sufficient connection with the UK. The Act does introduce the requirement for UK limited partnerships to always maintain an appropriate UK registered office address. So for the address to be considered appropriate, it must be in the jurisdiction of registration of the limited partnership. So for example, for SLPs, that means it must be in Scotland. And it also must be capable of receiving correspondence and passing it on to the attention of someone who can act on the limited partnership's behalf. There were some concerns at the drafting stages that this new introduction would prevent limited partnerships from being able to migrate their principal place of business overseas. Fortunately, the Act does not prevent this as the limited partnership can still move its principal place of business elsewhere, all the while maintaining a UK registered office address. So we can see here that a distinction has been drawn between the two concepts of registered office address and principal place of business. So if we take a closer look into this registered office address requirement, it's important to note that the UK registered office address must be one of the following. So it must either be the address of the principal place of business of the UK limited partnership or the usual residential address of a general partner who is an individual uh, or the address of the registered or principal office of a general partner that is a legal entity or an address of an authorised corporate service provider that is acting on behalf of the limited partnership. In light of this, those limited partnerships who do decide to migrate their principal place of business overseas uh, will most likely seek to rely on the address of an authorised corporate service provider that is acting on behalf of the limited partnership. So that's a trend that we do expect to see going forwards. To make you aware, there are several other uh, significant limited partnership reforms. Um, I think if we tried to cover them all, we, that would be deserving of a, of a webinar in itself. Uh, these are not yet in force. They are expected to come into force during the course of 2024. The specific timeline of this remains to be published, uh, but we are following this closely. And uh, for further information in relation to all other um, new reforms introduced by the Act, please do have a look at uh, Brodie's website at our Insights page. We have a blog series on there um, which can help answer questions. So I think 
that now brings us to a close. Looking at the time, I think we'll struggle to answer any questions, but if you do have any, please do get in contact with us and rest assured we will come back to you on this. Thanks very much for coming along today. We hope you find this session helpful and we hope you're as excited uh, for the MTA coming into, into force as we are. Thanks again.